Well, if you don't recognize that tune, thy word indeed is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Let's return to God's word together right now that it may light the way for us. Today's reading will be from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So again, that's Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God (laughs) demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Lord willing, we will spend two weeks in this text that we've just read together. This morning, focusing just on the first paragraph of Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. And I trust that you'll keep your Bible open and uh, reference it throughout the message so that uh, you can see whether the preacher is in fact saying what God says. I have a preacher friend in Boston who tells the story of John Cox and his wife Wendy who for years did the best they could to provide a home and food and clothing for themselves and their three daughters on a limited budget. John was an itinerant youth pastor, Wendy was a nurse. From time to time they would both work to get ahead financially, and then once in a while, Wendy would take off so she could stay home with the girls. Um, They shopped in thrift stores, they picked furniture from dumpsters, and then after years of renting, a new job gave them the opportunity to buy a house, begin to build some equity, and have some stability, but the only house they could afford was a fixer-upper a house so unusual and painted such a strange shade of blue that neighbors called it the Smurf house. (laughs) But the only thing good that this house had going for it was its address. The Coxes lived on Hope Street. As it turned out, the house needed even more work than they had originally anticipated. The pipes were rusted and leaking. There was toxic mold growing in the walls, and they didn't have the time or the skill or the money to get this place fixed up. They joked that the only way they would get their dream house is if some rich guy came along and fixed it all up for them, which is just what happened. One day, the Cox family awoke to the sound of a blaring bullhorn, good morning, Cox family. And some of you know where this is going. It was Ty Pennington and the crew of Extreme Makeover Home Edition 
who had showed up to fix the Cox's dilapidated house. If you're not aware of that reality TV show, the crew comes to some needy family, boots them out of their house for a week, and remodels the place for them um, at no charge. And for families who are struggling financially or with health issues or other needs, uh, Extreme Makeover Home Edition provides not only a house to live in, but a new start, a, a fresh opportunity to move beyond their hurts and problems into a, a better future. And that's what it meant for the Cox family. On the seventh day, what the show calls Reveal Day, the family returned to find their ugly, decrepit, moldy, toxic house transformed into a place of promise and possibility. Somebody had done for them what they could never do for themselves, and now it seemed like they really did live on Hope Street. Well, our current sermon series is about the extreme makeover that God is effecting in your life and mine. Romans 5 through 8 is about new life in Christ, new motives, new perspective, new relationship, new power for living life as God meant it to be lived, new possibilities for becoming the person that God meant for you to be. Life, you might say, on Hope Street. In verse 1 of our text, we see that this new life begins with justification. That was Drew's theme last week as he reviewed chapters 1 through 4 to help us make sense of the word therefore at the beginning of chapter 5. The good news that in Christ God justifies unworthy sinners. That is, he declares them righteous in his court so that there's no longer any condemnation hanging over their head. That's in verse 1 of our text. Also in verse 1 is this reference to peace with God. Because God has justified us, there's no longer any enmity between us and our Maker. We are at peace with one another. Through Him, verse 2, that is through Christ, we have received access by faith into a state of grace, a realm of existence, colored by the undeserved favor of God. He's gracious to us. That means not only justification and peace, but it means the enabling grace day by day, hour by hour, to live life in a way that pleases Him. And, Paul the Apostle writes, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Justification, peace, grace, and hope. Hope. We look forward to the day when we see God face to face. And we bask in His glory. <laughs> and some of that glory is reflected in us as we are made at last into the image of his son and become the kind of glorious human beings that God intended from the beginning of creation. It'll be when he's finished the extreme makeover and conformed us to the likeness of his son. Justification by faith, peace with God, the hope of glory, the hope of sharing in his glory, life on Hope Street. And Paul says we rejoice in this hope. Some of our translations say we boast in this hope. Um, from time to time, I review my Greek vocabulary, and I try to remember words by associating them with something familiar. And for some reason, the word that's translated rejoice or boast has stuck with me. It is kaka'amai, which reminds me of a rooster crowing. Doesn't it kind of sound a kaka'amai? <laughs> and it does, in fact, mean exulting, 
rejoicing with enthusiasm, like a rooster welcoming the morning. And certainly, Paul's rejoicing comes through in this paragraph. His exuberance, his exalting, his boasting, his rejoicing in this fantastic new life in Christ. So it's a little surprising that he says in verse 3 that we not only rejoice in hope, but we rejoice in suffering. I, I, I can see rejoicing, boasting, exulting in the hope of glory. But rejoicing, boasting, exulting in suffering? Is Paul crazy? One summer Sunday years ago, Jennifer and I were in Dora County on the Lord's Day and we worshiped at Bethel Baptist Church in, uh, what is it? It's not, Gil Rock, yeah, thank you. I knew it wasn't in, uh, in one of the bays. And the worship leader that morning was Mark Weborg, a great friend of our church camp, a friend of many of yours. And earlier that summer, Mark had had a horrific accident that mangled his arm. He had already, by that Sunday, had a number of surgeries. Uh, he was on pain medication, all kinds of tests. Well, after announcements, right at the beginning of the worship service, Mark said, so that I don't have to repeat this story over and over again, let me just give you an update on my situation. And he told a little bit about what he'd been going through. And then the bottom line was, so in a couple of weeks, they're going to amputate my arm. Now let's worship. Would you stand with me and sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name? I couldn't sing. And I could tell that my wife next to me was struggling. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Hail him as Lord of all, including horrific suffering. What is Mark Weborg? Crazy? Well, what Mark and the Apostle Paul have in common is a theology of suffering. May I give you a brief plug for theology? <laughs> Sometimes we're put off by that term. Lay Christians think that it's dry and dusty and academic and theoretical. Listen, theology is just the convictions that we live by. Convictions about God and God's ways with us and with the world. Don't be afraid of theology, including a theology of suffering. Now, Romans 5 does not give us a complete theology of suffering, but it does make its contribution. We're reminded that we can rejoice in suffering. Because, Paul writes, we know that suffering produces perseverance or endurance. It does something good in us and for us. Suffering produces perseverance. In 1924, at the age of 38, George Mallory, one of Britain's finest mountain climbers, died. He had tried and failed twice to summit Mount Everest, and on his third attempt, he disappeared. And it actually wasn't until 75 years later, in 1999, that his frozen body was discovered by other hikers about 2,000 feet from the summit. Well, sometime after his disappearance, his friends held a banquet in England to honor him, and some of the climbers who had been part of his ill-fated uh, expedition were in attendance, and at the close of the banquet, uh, one of these friends, a surviving team member, stood up and looked at the pictures of the expedition that had been posted all around the room, and then in tears, turned to face a huge picture of Mount Everest behind him and said, Mount Everest, 
you defeated us once, you defeated us twice, you defeated us three times, but someday we're going to defeat you because you can't grow and we can. God does not always make our problems smaller, but he can make you and me bigger and produce something good in us through our suffering. Perseverance. At intercession time and other times, your pastors and elders and pastors' wives will pray that God might relieve your suffering but you know what, if he chooses not to, and sometimes we even pray this way for you, that in your suffering, he'll make you a better person. More Christ-like. More enduring. More persevering. And then Paul writes that perseverance produces other dimensions of character. <laughs> perseverance is part of our character, if we are Christ-like, but there are other aspects of character that perseverance can produce. Not automatically, of course, or else everybody would be transformed because everybody suffers. And this transforming process is not a matter of gritting your teeth and saying over and over again, what doesn't kill me will make me stronger. And it's not a matter of adopting a, a kind of Turn your scars into stars attitude. It is rather a work of divine extreme makeover. Where God prunes and purifies and hones and humbles and stretches and sanctifies and deepens and toughens and matures and curing us of shallowness develops character in us. Now, if you're suffering right at the moment, this may all seem like cold comfort. You may feel very much like I feel often. Lord, I'd settle for a little less character if it meant a little less suffering. So let's tweak the metaphor of the house on Hope Street and imagine, will you, that you're not the Cox family, but you're the house. God's fixing you up. How does it feel? One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes, I've used it here maybe more than once, so it may sound familiar to some of you, is this one. Lewis writes, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house than the one you thought of throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little college, cottage. He is building a palace. He intends to live there himself. It is possible to rejoice, boast, exult in suffering, when you realize what God is up to in your life. Not easy. I didn't say it was easy. But it is possible. The extreme makeover has begun. There's plenty of work to be done, painful work, and it's going to take more than seven days. But it's underway, and God won't quit until you are the glorious person that he intends you to be. So we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character, and character, the end of verse 4, hope. Hope. 
Back to hope again. Why? <laughs> because if God goes to all this trouble, he must care about me. If God is not defeated by suffering, but uses it for my good, what can he not do? <laughs> if I survived yesterday's suffering and grew through it, and I'm surviving today's suffering and being stretched by it, then yeah, maybe I'll make it to glory. Hope. And hope does not disappoint, because as verse 5 says, in big ways and small, God lavishly pours out by the Holy Spirit reassurances of his love for us. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. He cares about us. Too much to let us remain a dilapidated house. He's making us into a palace. So, with that theology, with that perspective on their suffering, thousands, millions of Christians down through the centuries have been able to say with Paul in Romans 8, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We can say with Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And we're able to say with Paul in Philippians 1, we're confident that he who began a good work in us will continue it until the day that Jesus comes again. Talk like that. You're living on Hope Street. So, Paul's not crazy. Mark Weeborg is not crazy. They know something. And so does Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice was the national security advisor to President Bush and then was Secretary of State for four years. First African-American woman to hold either of those important posts. She spoke to the National Prayer Breakfast years ago and said, among other things, we are living through a time of testing and consequence and praying that our wisdom and will are equal to the task before us. And it is at times like these that we are reminded of a paradox that it is a privilege to struggle. A privilege to struggle for what is right and true. A privilege to struggle for freedom over tyranny. A privilege even to struggle with the most difficult and profound moral choices. She continued, American slaves used to sing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, glory hallelujah. Growing up, I'd often wonder at the seeming contradiction contained in this line, but as I grew older, I came to realize that there is no contradiction at all. I believe the same message is found in the Bible, in Romans 5, where we are told to Rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen to that. What Ty Pennington and his crew do for people's houses, God wants to do for your life. Transform you from the inside out. And the good news of the gospel is, there's hope for you. God himself is ready to move into your life and transform you into the person that he made you to be. And all you have to do is ask him, invite him. Some of you have never done that. I, in a group this size, I am fairly sure that there must be at least some people who, however religious and faithful in church attendance even, have never personally invited our gracious God to come in and Remake us into the image of his son. <laughs> Forgive your sins. 
guarantee you a home in heaven, begin changing your life, but you're not there yet. You're still living on, as my friend in Boston puts it, despair drive or regret road or fear street. God wants to move you over to Hope Street. Others of you have made the great uh, invitation to God and His grace, made the move to Hope Street already, but have kind of forgotten what it looks like and feels like. Either because in your personal life there is some issue, some suffering, some grief, or because of the darkness of our times and the uncertainty in, in which we're living, we've kind of forgotten the hope of the gospel. That's not where God wants us to live. And so let me pray for you and for myself. Father, I'll begin by praying for those of us who have embraced the gospel at some point in our lives, have accepted Christ as Savior, are seeking to follow Him as Lord of our lives, and have yielded to your initiative to make us over into the likeness of Jesus, I pray for us that we will not forget these great truths that we have embraced, that you'll use Romans 5 and the rest of our study in the months to come of these great chapters to rekindle our exaltation in the gospel Let that make a difference in the way we live, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. And then, too, I want to pray for any present for whom this is, um, well, they've been listening to me talk to other people. This doesn't describe them. They're not on Hope Street. God, I pray that you'll do what no preacher's words can do. And that is awaken faith and trust, joy and peace and hope in the hearts of those who still have yet to trust the Savior. And if I've described you in this prayer, then let me, let me take just a moment more and let you know what you might do about this message. For one thing, if anything in it is unclear, or you're just not sure, I or one of my fellow pastors or elders would be delighted to spend some time talking with you about these matters. It would be our great privilege to do so. Or you might simply pray as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and say something like this, God, I am attracted to this good news and I know that I need a makeover. I'm far from perfect. I, if I were to die tonight, would have no good reason to expect that you would welcome me into your perfect heaven. But I believe what I've heard that your son suffered the penalty that I deserve for my sins, and I'm going to trust that that's all you require of me, is that trust, that faith. And I invite you into my life, asking for the grace and the peace, the justification and the hope that these lines in Romans 5 talk about. Thank you for listening. And know that God hears and God delights to answer a prayer like that. And we'll welcome you to Hope Street. Amen.